This is CBC Here and Now. Prolonged school closures increases inequalities in learning, particularly for those who are vulnerable. I think everyone agrees they want to see schools open this September. Getting students back to class, the government outlines its plans for the classroom, including the backup plans in case COVID cases climb. I'm Anthony Germain in Gander, and uh, as you heard, the education plan, the COVID plan, that is our top story tonight. I'm Peter Cowan in the studio. Another big story we're following, crowding in bars on George Street. To see uh, that happen on the weekend is very disappointing. We all want a socially safe and responsible time down here in our historic little street. The businesses have a responsibility too. They know what the guidelines are. Videos and photos showing crowding on George Street this weekend. Health officials say they're going to meet with bar owners. It's a chilly start in the east, but don't worry, there's a warm up on the way. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Peter Cowan. We start tonight with the province's plan to have students back in school by September. Government explained how it all worked this afternoon. Anthony Germain was in Springdale for that announcement and he's with us live. Anthony, I understand it's not just one plan, we got three. Break it down for us. How's this going to work? Yeah, that's right, Peter, because nobody has a crystal ball and can't exactly say what's going to happen with COVID come September, October, December. There are three scenarios within the plan, so let's take a look at them, starting with scenario number one, which I guess we could say is the, the most normal plan. And in that plan, we're going to see essentially students staying with the classes that they've been used to. Uh, they'll be with the same sorts of groups of students. The big difference will be there'll be a, an emphasis on sanitization and social distancing uh, within that group. Now in scenario two, this is where things change. If we see a greater prevalence of COVID, you'll see up to 70% of education happening in an online environment, maybe 50% depending on how serious it is. Also, and here's the wrinkle for a lot of parents, we'll see alternating classrooms with students actually changing. The details on that, well, that all has to be worked Worked out. And then if we take a look at scenario number three, this is the serious scenario, the one that we've actually been living in since uh, since March, and that is a total shutdown back to where things are with online education and the classrooms essentially shut down, although teachers, some of them, will stay uh, with special arrangements for students, who, exceptional students, students with special needs. So that in a nutshell is the three scenarios. You can check out our website to get more details and go to the government site to see the entire 28 page plan if you like. And it's been a very, very busy day, Peter, as you well know. It started with Dr. Fitzgerald essentially trying to uh, make the case and maybe even relieve some concerned parents, some concerned teachers and concerned students by pointing out that we're learning more about COVID-19 and it looks as though children don't present the same kind of threat as those of us who are, shall we say, a little bit older. We know that in general, children tend to have less severe forms of the disease uh, and tend to be less uh, effective at transmitting it than say, if we compare it to influenza, where they're actually very, very good at transmitting it. But you're right, we are still learning about this every day. And part of what we're looking at in other jurisdictions um, who are having children back in school at this point is to, uh, to look at transmission patterns in children. Now, some of the interesting things also contained in the plan has to do with, uh, first of all, social distancing, especially for kindergarten to grade six. There's an admission in the plan that two meters, that's just not practical, especially in classes that are packed uh, with little young children. So the difference there is going to be uh, um, one meter, so it can't be any less than a meter, but a recognition that two meters is not practical. Also, there is no obligatory mask policy for either the students in any grade level or the teachers. So we talked about some of those complexities with Premier Dwight Ball at the news conference today. This is very difficult, as we know, for kids, especially the K-6 to kids, who just even understand the importance of this. So if there's a situation where this cannot be done, it will be stressed that there are safety issues, that other things that can be done as well to address that. We recognize that masks will be very difficult for a teacher or for students to be able to wear, uh, to wear. but it's, you know, realizing what's practical, what is not practical. Safe physical distancing it will continue to be something that's fundamental in everything that we do in our society. It is proven, uh, but in situations where it cannot be done, we must look for other solutions. That will include working with teachers in those classrooms. 
So some degree as we get back to the schools open this fall, there's going to be a bit of an experiment to see exactly what's going to work. And again, it depends on what COVID prevalence is like. And I guess to, sum to summarize a, a big part of today, there's a $20 million announcement. Every teacher in the province is going to get a new laptop. Students from grade 7 to grade 12 are going to get Chromebooks. And that's an indication that there is some preparation for the possibility of scenarios 2 and scenarios 3, a whole new education online. Peter. Thank you very much, Anthony. We've got a whole lot more coverage on this topic, including what are parents thinking? Well, we talked to one parent who's pleased with the plan. Jillian Pearson runs the Facebook group Parents for Affordable Child Care. She says parents are eager to see their children get back into the classroom. A lot of parents wanted to make sure that the plan as it is right now is to return as, as close to normal as possible. And then in the event if their numbers were to increase, that there was a backup plan in place to ensure that uh, as many children could stay in school as possible, you know, weighing the risks and weighing the benefits to keeping kids in school. So it looks like on the second level that if there's a moderate risk, which I'm not, I'm not sure what that is at this point, that they're going to try and keep as many K to six kids in school as possible and all kids with exceptionalities and disabilities. Um, so that's the right approach definitely because the social and emotional development of kids is a huge part of public health as well. Now what about the union representing teachers? It says it still has big concerns about how this is all going to work. The NLTA says it wasn't given a chance to weigh in on this final plan. It's worried that physical distancing won't be possible with overcrowded classrooms in the province isn't committing any more resources in order to fix How do you maintain physical distancing, which is what we've heard for the past four months? How do you maintain the cleaning protocols? How do you provide service to students? These are the questions you need to raise. And right now when I look at this plan, there are many, many unanswered questions. Now, the opposition parties also believe the school reopening plan needs more work. They say many of the details and responsibilities have been passed down to the schools and the teachers themselves. Yeah, the piece that I heard today from Minister War is that, uh, and, and, that teachers and schools are in the best position to determine uh, what measures need to be taken in the school. So what I'm hearing there is that further downloading on teachers and staff at the school level. And uh, if I know anything from my own experience as a teacher, from the teachers I worked with, their plates are already full. So it, it's almost as if it's been downloaded, blame, and, and the full responsibility is there on the schools themselves. Totally, uh, totally unacceptable. I would think the plan leaves very little to instill confidence within the parents who are sending their children back to school in September. Uh, I think the parents were looking for details as to what uh, they can expect with their children returning front and foremost safety, and I don't think this really did the job. In fact, in the school system, we may say that we would assign that a failing grade. We're going to continue our coverage of the education plan over the rest of Here and Now tonight. Just ahead, Anthony has an interview with Education Minister Brian War. We'll also have his interview with two former kindergarten teachers about the challenges of teaching young children in a time of COVID. And we're going to have my interview with the president of the NLTA. Well, in other news tonight, police say there is no risk to public safety after a man was found dead on a residential street in the west end of St. John's. It happened during the early hours on Sunday, and as Here and Now's Heather Gillis reports, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. It's a much quieter day in the west end of St. John's, but there's still a police presence here following Sunday's suspicious death. Officers are going door to door on Craig Miller Avenue canvassing the area. Certainly it's a very active investigation. It's a much different scene from the night before last when some residents say they heard yelling around 4 a.m. Then someone's surveillance camera on Old Topsail Road just a street away from the crime scene captures this. In all, what appear to be five gunshots ring out over the neighborhood. When police arrived minutes later, they found a man laying dead in the street. About an hour later, the RNC sent out a tweet telling Craig Miller residents to shelter in place. That order remained in effect until supper time. About a dozen armed tactical officers, as well as the canine unit, were seen marching across the street Sunday. Police focused their attention on a red SUV, the driver's door left open. Ground search and rescue was on the scene and a drone was used to gather evidence. Today, police are saying this death wasn't random. Uh, so we don't perceive any additional uh, public safety concern there. 
uh, we're going to remain uh, in the area and communicating with residents to ensure that uh, you know there's an open, open line of communication there. Police are working with the medical examiner to determine the man's cause of death. So far, there's no word on a suspect. Police are asking anyone with information to come forward and call them or Crime Stoppers. They're looking for people in this area who have door cam or CCTV footage. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Police also asked people on Huntley Drive in Shoal Harbor to stay inside during an incident yesterday. Clarenville RCMP confirms this afternoon they were dealing with a mental health crisis. Police say a man had threatened to kill another person and had barricaded himself inside a house. Emergency response, crisis negotiation and canine teams attended the scene along with mental health professionals and firefighters who blocked access to the street. Officers entered the house around 8 p.m. after negotiations failed. The man was apprehended under the Mental Health Act and transported for medical assistance. Well, two different companies are facing a series of charges from a workplace fall that killed a 26-year-old man. Chris Fifield fell to his death in 2018 when he was working on the 12-story Hilton Garden Inn in downtown St. John's. Lancor Concrete, his employer, has been charged with eight counts of violating occupational health and safety laws, including failure to ensure guardrails were in place, failing to provide adequate training and instruction, and failing to supply and maintain necessary safety equipment and systems. The hotel's principal contractor, Magna Contracting and Management, is facing three charges, one of them around time management and not organizing work schedules to provide safe working conditions. Those companies are due in court next month. Well, another day with no new COVID cases, but pictures from George Street this weekend are stoking fears of a second wave. Photos of overflowing bars in downtown St. John's have health officials and politicians warning people to follow the rules to avoid being locked down into quarantine again. Here now is Jeremy Eaton with that story tonight. It's not uncommon for there to be crowds of people hanging around on George Street over the weekend, but these times are anything but common. And when photos of a packed bar started to circulate on social media, it caught a lot of people's attention, including the Premier of the province. Disappointment. Uh, there was no question. We expect people to be responsible. We expect adults to make, you know, good, responsible decisions and just follow common sense. And so some of the images that I saw uh, over this weekend is not something that illustrates to me that people were making responsible decisions. So there will be meetings now with the uh, chief medical officer and public health officials with those responsible for those businesses. We need to make sure that, you know, when we put in measures, we put them in for the safety of all our residents. It is not meant so that you can go and have a party somewhere. Johnny Cody of the George Street Association says the photo is taken out of context. Knowing that one bar specifically had four spaces that were being closely monitored, but then a sprinkle of rain came and all of a sudden those four turned into two spaces. And of course that photo was taken at the perfect time to show that temporary congestion before a staff responsibly stepped in to do their job to separate out that group. And that's what everybody saw. It's a waste of time sometimes to try to like beg everybody to see both sides. So the only key message here is we're all leaning in, we're all working hard, uh, and I speak on behalf of the venue owners uh, and everyone involved to try to put our best foot forward. While dancing isn't allowed, this dance floor looked a lot more like Saturday Night Fever than Footloose. In a statement, the owners of Confusion and Rob Roy say they recognize this weekend presented moments of concern and that staff is working hard to ensure a socially safe environment inside their establishments. The owners say they're committed to their patrons, staff and the public to get things right as they try and establish their new normal. The bar does have orange markings to show where people should stand while waiting in line and St. John's Mayor Danny Breen hopes bar owners will be enforcing it. We want to avoid a situation where we end up where we were a month ago back in the in the lockdown situation. So the businesses have that responsibility. They know what the guidelines are and they need to make sure those guidelines are in place. And the province has a responsibility too to uh, to make sure that the businesses understand the parameters under which they have to operate. And uh, we all need to keep working through this so we can uh, so we can keep moving forward. 
back on George Street, it's still business as usual, and Cody hopes next weekend will be less controversial than the last. I think it is important to know that the owners and the management and the staff and the patrons and the public are all on the same page. And we all want a socially safe and responsible time down here in our historic little street. Uh, and I think we all need to be compassionate to each other. It's not like uh, the staff are just kicking their heels up and saying what odds. They are under strict legal guidelines to do their jobs and they're doing it as best they can, double the staff, with often a 30% capacity uh, versus the traditional 100%. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Well, to Labrador now, where two people and a dog are lucky to be alive after their float plane crashed in Northwest River last week. Lar Aylward and his wife were in a boat when they watched the plane take off around 5 a.m. on Canada Day. It quickly veered to the side before crashing down into the water. One of the guys uh, in the water, he said, uh, get my dog. So we took his dog aboard. Then we, we got over to him and... Uh, Hauled him into the, over the over the gunnel and started picking up the debris because Buddy said he was already right on the pontoon. And I said we had to get him to shore because both of them had a like you see had a smack in the head. The pilot, the passenger, and the dog were the only ones in the plane. Plenty of heat in the province. It's up through Labrador right now, but as we head through the week, we'll start to see a warm up further east as well. I'll have all those details and your full forecast coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Obviously, a big day for education in the province with the announcement on how to get schools reopened in September. And joining me now is the Minister of Education, Brian War. So, Mr. War, one of the uh, things that has was announced today was about social distancing in the schools. Two meters is not possible, but for weeks now we've been told that's what we should be doing. Can you explain that? Certainly, uh, you know, I, we take uh, direction, uh, Anthony, from uh, from public health officials, and you know, we've uh, we've had them uh, uh, with us in consultation the whole way uh, when when we were developing this plan. With regards to social distancing, uh, you know, certainly we're we're going to uh, implement a uh, you know direction uh, for the districts to certainly deal with administration and staff at, at schools, and uh, certainly uh, you know we'll do the best job possibly that we can uh, to ensure that we get as much distancing as we can. You know, if we have to use uh, alternate classrooms uh, to be able to do that. I mean, certainly that's where we'll go, but, uh, you know, we uh, we certainly are, are going to uh, recommend so co cohorts as well in, in classrooms and, uh, you know, keep and try and keep children as, and students as safe as possible. Now, it says that um, you're, you won't be any closer than one meter, but still it seems as though, you know, we're going to accept a certain amount of risk for children that we don't for the general population. Is that just the reality we have to live with? You know, we're certainly, uh, COVID is a reality that we're going to have to live with. And, uh, you know, certainly we're going to, you know, uh, safety of children and, and, and staff, uh, teachers is paramount uh, for us all. And uh, we want to put make sure that we put in all measures. Uh, you know, you look at uh, uh, hygiene, uh, hand washing, uh, their, uh, you know, the, uh, the personal assessment that they will uh, sure to take every day before uh, uh, heading to class. And, uh, you know, we'll uh, make sure that we have, uh, you know, arrows uh, pointed to the direction of, of travel. Uh, you know, we will implement whatever measures that we can, uh, possibly can, uh, including the, the one meter for all uh, students and staff. Now, at the start of this pandemic, we were told not to wear masks, it wouldn't help, and we learn now that wearing a mask actually stops the spread of transmission. So why isn't every kid in Newfoundland and Labrador going to be required to wear a mask? And, and what about the teachers with face shields and masks? How, how come th that is not something that's part of the plan? It's certainly uh, something again that we'll take uh, we'll take direction from uh, from chief medical officer he for health and public health officials. I mean, you know, uh, it's a per person's own choice. I mean, if uh, if teachers uh, decide that, that you know they want to wear a mask, I mean that's completely up to them. Uh, with regards to students, uh, again, I don't know if there's. Uh, you know, when we when we chat with uh, with public health officials, uh, you know, we're looking for evidence uh, that masks do work. I, mean, I don't know if that's there. Uh, you know, I uh, I certainly uh, I've worn a mask. I mean, uh, I've sometimes I've struggled with it. Sometimes I haven't. But it's uh, it's some, certainly something that uh, you know, if parents uh, want to have their children wearing masks, I mean, absolutely. There's there's no issue with that. And the last question for you, as the minister responsible for education, is there any any reassurance you can give parents who are watching here and now tonight about how we're going to make the decisions, whether it's scenario one, scenario two, scenario three, once the school is reopened in September? Again, uh, you know, we, we will certainly uh, assess the situation once sub September starts and we'll see where the pandemic uh, is at that particular point in time. You know, I've uh, talked to many uh, teachers, uh, many students along the way. I mean, we're lo just looking back, uh, just looking forward to getting back to class and certainly we want to make sure that we get them back as safely as we possibly can. All right, well, Brian Moore, thank you very much. And thank you. This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Bit of a chilly start to the week, although, Ashley, I feel like we've been spoiled with our June weather, and now anything less than 20 degrees, it's just like, eh, I don't want to have to even deal with it. It's true. We definitely acclimatized uh, earlier this year than we normally do. But yes, those temperatures a little bit chilly, certainly here in the east. Only reached a high near 12 degrees in St. John's today. Let's take a look at those numbers across the board. Now, the further west you go, the warmer it is. 23 degrees was the afternoon high in Corner Brook, 25 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and then 22, a number of areas, 24 degrees in Cartwright. So beautiful. Uh, that's where all the heat is right now. And uh, as we speak, lost a degree in St. John's, couple in Corner Brook, and then still sitting at 20 degrees in Nain. So a beautiful evening on tap. We do uh, did see plenty of sunshine earlier this afternoon. Some clouds have developed through central 
and uh, a few showers as well through the interior. That risk will continue for the next few hours. We're starting to see some uh, development for the potential for some thunderstorms as well for southeastern portions of Labrador as we head through the next few hours. But we should generally see some clearing skies in the east, however, the uh, clouds will move back in as we head towards the morning hours. But overall, a fairly quiet evening. Our temperatures will be uh, cool as well, anywhere from 7 to 11 degrees in Port of Basque. The winds generally light, anywhere from 10 to 15 kilometers per hour in the east. And then uh, westerlies up in northern uh, Labrador, 15 to 20 kilometers per hour tonight. And generally, your temperatures will still be in the double digits. Again, that risk of a few showers for Lab City, though as we head through the overnight. Now tomorrow looks fairly quiet. Again, some cloud cover in the morning. We could see a few pop-up afternoon showers through pretty much Gander eastward towards the Avalon. Mainly the southern Avalon is where that risk of showers will be. And then again, for southeastern portions of Labrador, you could see or hear a few rumbles of thunder, maybe even through the interior as well, through Happy Valley Goose Bay. Uh, but overall, fairly quiet day. Temperatures will be fairly nice as well, but you will see some showers roll in early uh, Wednesday morning for Lab West. So here's the temperatures again a little cool about 16 degrees for St. John's anywhere on the Avalon really in the mid teens and then even along the northeast coast as well towards central and the west you're looking at a beautiful afternoon temperatures in the 20 to 23 or 24 degree range and even St. Anthony you're going to see a temperature near 21 tomorrow with plenty of sunshine on tap. Up through the big lands you're looking at 27 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay again that risk of uh, some thunderstorms for you and towards Mary's Harbor as well 24 degrees will be your afternoon high and then same thing for Lab City with plenty of sunshine again those showers will move in late day. The showers will continue to make their way further east as we head uh, through the day on Wednesday. By the time uh, Wednesday night and early Thursday morning rolls around, that's when we'll start to see those showers for the island and they'll spread east into Thursday afternoon and Thursday evening. But temperatures are going to continue to climb. So about 18 degrees by Wednesday for St. John's into the mid 20s again through central and the west. A little cooler down along the south coast as we get back into that onshore flow for about 15 degrees for Port of Basque for you on Wednesday. 21 for Happy Valley Goose Bay and 22 again for Nain. So it does look like a lovely uh, couple of days. As we head into the weekend, temperatures are going to slowly start to climb. We should be in the mid to high teens by Friday and then Saturday, 22 degrees with some sunshine. And then for um, central Newfoundland, you're looking at those uh, showers. So it'll drop those temperatures just a little bit on Thursday and then recover quite nicely for Friday and Saturday. Looks like we'll see the return of that humidity as well. Same thing for western Newfoundland, but a little bit more unsettled. We're still looking at that risk of showers and temperatures in the mid 20s. For eastern Labrador, some showers by and through Thursday. Then Friday looks nice. Again, lots of heat and humidity in play. We could even flirt with the 30 degree mark for Friday. And then for Lab West, you're looking at temperatures in the 20 to 26 degree range by then. Had to share this great shot of the calm water. Thank you so much to Mike for sending that lovely shot in. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. I'm betting Mike was out catching a few fish on the weekend in that. Well, something a little bit bigger than fish. St. Vincent's on the Southern Avalon has been a busy spot. I know I was out there this weekend and it seemed like everyone was wanting to go out and see these guys, the whales. They've been putting on quite a show every day. Several whales have been in the region for weeks now. Now locals tell us they tend to get more active later afternoon into the evening. That's the best time to catch them. They also warn that the water can be quite dangerous with the undertow from the waves. So they're urging all visitors to stay away from the water's edge. Well, a rebellion against the leadership of RNC Chief Joe Boland has caught the attention of the Justice Minister, Andrew Parsons. In a rare move, the association that represents most frontline officers with the force held a non-confidence vote on the chief's leadership, and the results show there is overwhelming dissatisfaction. Andrew Parsons is now trying to prevent the situation from boiling over, and he did a very delicate diplomatic dance when asked about it earlier today. I have 100% faith and confidence in Chief Joe Boland, but I also have 100% faith and confidence in the RNCA, and I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. There's nothing ever easy about these types of relationships or about this job, but you know what? These things take time. They're like any relationship that's out there. They, they take work, they take understanding, they take clear communication, and they take trust. I have that in both of these entities. I have that 
in the men and women of the RNCA. I have that in, in Chief uh, Joe Boland. I'll continue to have that, and I hope they have that in me. Now, Parsons doesn't believe the turmoil is distracting from the important work of the police force and says he'll work with both sides to find a resolution. As for Chief Boland, he issued a defiant statement on Friday accusing the police association of trying to discredit and intimidate him, and he blames the non-confidence vote on a few officers who don't like his style of accountability and those opposed to some of the changes he's made. The RNCA, meanwhile, has declined comment. Welcome back to Here and Now. Last month, we told you about an eight-year-old boy's close call on the Manuals River. You also heard from his mother, who wants others to know just how dangerous rivers can be. Strong currents swept Frankie Kelly away, and tonight, the young boy comes face to face with the quick-thinking parent who leapt in to save him. Here now, Cease Hare has that story. This is where it all happened. Now, two families who were strangers a month ago are reuniting here. The rescuer, and the rescued, brought together by good fortune. This is how the Manuals River looked on July 5th, the day Frankie Kelly found himself in desperate need of help. 
The swollen, rushing river was too much for the eight-year-old. Today, it's much calmer, much less ferocious. Frankie's mom, Gina Kelly, says they were wading in the water. Before she knew it, her son was gone. He just got away from me really fast. You know, he just, um, I mean, I, I still close my eyes and I just see him like floating away from me, you know, and it was really fast. Well, I was like there on the side, like kind of swimming along, and then I see a head in the water. It was um, wrecky, of course. I mean, it was scary when I seen it because he went under the water and then he went back up. So we were like right over there on the, and like, by the river there and then we're like dad dad there's someone drifting down in the river i couldn't breathe because i was going up and down and up and down now when you say up and down up and down you mean going under the water don't yeah. you what was that like frankie it was scary i heard other people kind of screaming as well so when i looked i seen young frankie floating down and i kind of had no choice i don't think uh, because i didn't hesitate I ran along the side of the rocks here. I flicked my phone down and I jumped in right around here, I guess. Once in the water, Darren Colomb was able to get ahead of the young boy and grab hold of him. The whole time thinking about the steep rapids that lay just a short distance ahead of them. And did you ever lose sight of him? No, now, at one point in time I did actually. I had him for a second and then he kind of got sucked under for a few seconds. Uh, it was a small little panic and then he popped right back up again. So I just said, well, go get him again. So by this time, it was only a few strokes more to get them. Colombe's girls are thrilled with this story's happy ending. I was really happy for him. I mean, it's like he was like a hero. I mean, I didn't really matter about that because we all knew and we knew everyone was OK. So all I can say, it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> what word would you describe Darren's actions that day? Good. <laughs> Great. Great. <laughs> it was good. It was great. Was he a hero? Yeah. yeah. Colomb, a teacher at Larry's Brook Junior High, says he's just glad no one was hurt and the children get to enjoy the rest of their summer. It was a beautiful ending to a scary little day. <laughs> Cease here, CBC News, Conception Bay South. Well, there's so many challenges facing education this fall and the school district wants to get everybody back in the classrooms. One key area that's going to be challenging is K to three. And so we've invited two elementary school teachers, two retired teachers. Uh, joining us now is uh, Donna Reddick and uh, Tracy Forsey. Tracy, let me start with you. We'll start from the kids' point of view. What's the challenge from their point of view? I mean, the biggest challenge for them are gonna be the physical distancing part. Um, children naturally migrate towards each other and we've taught them to do that and to, to go in groups to learn and to share and now we're telling them to stay apart. I think they're going to be anxiety ridden. Really? Donna? Yes, I totally would agree with that for sure. Um, there's no doubt about it. Little children, no matter how many times you tell them, they will indeed forget and uh, when you bring them in the classroom and if, if we indeed go with separating our desks six feet, um, they're going to find it very difficult to remain in that space. They really are. And, and they're uh, used to circle tables now. Absolutely. So the kids sit around in the groups of five at a circle table. So they don't even have individual desks right now. No. The majority. And is there distance learning for K-3? to I mean, how realistic is that? <laughs> I've seen some of my uh, past co-workers trying to educate them. The kids have literally fallen asleep on the video. <laughs> yeah. They tend to get tuned down. They, it was great for a week. And then after that, it just started to wean off. It's difficult. It's too much screen time. It's, uh, it gets boring. It gets monotonous. And tiring, right? With respect to kindergarten kids in particular, I mean, how do you stop them from putting things in their mouth and coming over to hug their friends? I mean, well, yeah, once again, once they come into school, uh, it's going to be discussions that you're going to have with your kindergartens and uh, you're going to, you know, you're going to sit down, you're going to talk to them about things. This is, this is our, our new normal and, uh, you know, you've got to put it in their language. And, yeah. and so we're not going to be putting things in our mouth because they have a lot of germs and, you know, we have to be washing our hands very frequently after we come from the bathroom, before we eat our recess, before we have our lunch. 
things are going to be so different for kids. They're, they're not going to be going to the cafeteria to eat. They're probably going to be just sitting in their desk at yeah, recess that's the time, other, That's the other part of it, time. just staying in their classrooms all day long. That's the, going to be really difficult. The movement is going to be so limited for them. Yeah. And even for things that they're so used to in their daily routine, um, not going to the music room. You know, probably, yeah. I mean, I don't even know, they'll be, will they be allowed to sing? Yeah. Jim. Gym, Gym um, musical yeah. instruments. I and mean, even going to the washroom. I mean, absolutely. are you going to clean up after every child goes in the washroom? That's not possible. And is that something the teacher's going to have to take on? Well, cleaning is an interesting point, and maybe we can segue from the kids' point of view, the teacher's point of view. So, who is going to handle the cleaning? The teacher will end up. The teacher will end up doing the majority of the cleaning in their classroom, whether they want to or not, and whether it's just going to happen. Absolutely. I totally There's agree no with way that. a caretaker can look after no. all those rooms. No, it's, it's not just possible. Too, too many children, and I agree. I can see a um, container of Lysol wipes, and the teacher's yeah. going to be going around with her wipes on yeah. every child's desk. You can't give a little child a wipe and say, wipe your table. They're just going to go flick, flick, done, if they do it at all. It yeah. just doesn't work. The teacher is most definitely going to have to be involved. This is going to be fairly stressful for educators. It's going right? to be stressful for educators with the cleaning. It's going to be stressful with the duty. If you can't leave those kids in the class, you have to leave them in the classroom. Yes. Recess and lunch. Yes. Are you, st are you supposed to stay with them at recess and lunch? So you go, you know, the whole whatever many hours they're going to be in there without leaving your room. Yeah. No breaks. Yeah. <laughs> Look. Yeah. What about the actual education? Because you know that, that age group, those foundation years, have yeah. been identified by research as being really key for your, your whole life. Absolutely. So if the, the curriculum outcome says, you know, a child will learn how to multiply or to add these numbers, like, how, are you actually, how are teachers actually going to stick to what they're supposed to teach them while managing a classroom in a COVID atmosphere? going to be extremely difficult there's no doubt about it and especially in the primary years uh, children are very um, hands-on learners mm -hmm. um, our curriculum in primary is very play-based curriculum it's all so, about manipulatives absolutely. and holding things and hands-on yeah. and uh, I guarantee you the teachers are going to do a great job with this because they will their, their first concern is going to be about those absolutely. kids and getting that curriculum in and absolutely. they will do it what choice but do it's they have? going to they don't have a choice no. But it's going to be extremely challenging. It for will. Them. But the nature of a, of a primary elementary teacher, uh, you know, they're very nurturing and caring, yeah. and these children are like your like your kids yeah. for a year. The minute That's, they walk in, absolutely. Yeah. And you take ownership and you do everything in your power to make sure that they have you know a good year in your classroom. Yeah. And when they come back now, uh, post COVID, I mean, one of the very f first things you want to do is you make sure that they're comfortable and they feel safe and they don't fear, they don't have fear or anxiety, yeah. any of those things. You really want to try to alleviate any of those concerns that right. children are going to come back with. Well, the COVID cohort is going to be very, very interesting to watch uh, from both the teacher's point of view and the kids. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Really appreciate it. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's not just those teachers who are wondering about how things are going to work this fall. The NLTA is also raising uh, concerns about government's plans for September. They say it's not possible to do what's needed without more resources and without more teachers. One of the things you were talking about is class sizes and the need for smaller class sizes. This isn't a new message. This is one the NLTA has been talking about long before the pandemic. Why are you raising it now? Well, it's a continuation. We've been suggesting and arguing that a review of the teacher allocation model was long overdue. Cabinet committed to it in 2011. That's all, nine years ago. This allocation model review, this independent allocation model review is long overdue. What we do see in a COVID environment right now, so it wouldn't be accurate to say we're just raising it now. We've been raising it for years. But it's important to recognize that the emphasis on physical distancing in our schools have really drawn attention to why it's so important in this environment that we need to be concerned with the number of students we have in any classroom. What sort of size classrooms would you like to see in September, assuming the risk continues to be low and in-person classes is kind of the main focus of education? There needs to be a lowering of it. I think right now the numbers that are currently in our teacher allocation model, which had been revised when full day kindergarten was introduced. There was adjustments made in four to six and seven to nine. We think that needs to be revisited. It's why we've been calling for an independent allocation model review. I have every confidence that an independent assessment would show that we need to revisit our allocation model and our class size allocations at present are too large. 
We've seen uh, that there are going to be no new resources put into the education system for the fall. Do you think it is realistic to be able to do the extra cleaning, the extra administration, the extra work that teachers are going to have to do to prepare online and in class and teaching without any new resources? The plan as referenced right here in front of us does not have reference to resources that are needed. They will absolutely be needed. The Premier ensures that further consultation regarding the implementation will be conducted. I would certainly stand by the position that without an infusion of resources, it will be very challenging to have a safe and orderly environment for our students. And these are why these consultations with the Chief Medical Officer, Public Health Authorities, and the Department of Education, EECD, and the school districts must occur. Any policy that's not adequately supported will be a policy that will fail. Well, thank you very much for sharing your concerns with me. Oh, you're very welcome. My pleasure. Welcome back to Here and Now. This is the seventh anniversary of the rail disaster in Lac Megantic, Quebec, and a new memorial was dedicated in the town today. 48 silhouettes étoilées en hommage aux 47 victimes et une en hommage à la communauté marquée par la tragédie. 
47 people were killed at the center of the town, which was destroyed when a runaway train carrying crude oil derailed and exploded. The memorial space took three years to build. It's on the former site of a cafe in the heart of the town. Most of the victims were staff and patrons of that cafe. Bob Ray has been named as Canada's new ambassador to the United Nations. He says the job is in his DNA. Dad was a diplomat, served in the Canadian Foreign Service for 40 years. He served as our ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva, as well as in New York. And uh, when I was in politics, I used to joke that I was actually born in a log embassy. So uh, I know, what, I know what, that, what that condition is. Ray was interim leader of the federal Liberals before Justin Trudeau became leader. He was also Premier of Ontario in the 1990s when he led the NDP. Most recently, he's been Canada's special envoy on humanitarian and refugee issues and special envoy to Myanmar. This follows Canada's failure to win a temporary seat on the United Nations Security Council. Well, in New York, a white Canadian woman is being charged with falsely accusing a black man of threatening her life. Amy life. Cooper was seen on cell phone video recorded by Christian Cooper on Memorial Day. The two are not related. Mr. Cooper is a bird watcher who asked Ms. Cooper to leash her dog, as is the law. She objected and phoned 911, telling the operator he was threatening her life. The exchange went viral, seen by many as an illustration of how black people are falsely reported to the police. The Manhattan DA said Amy Cooper will be charged with filing a false report, a misdemeanor pun punishable by up to a year in jail. As calls grow across the country for police reform, there is a push for more data on how officers interact with people of color to get more insights on systemic racism. Ontario is now the first province to start collecting race-based data from all its police forces. But even advocates pushing for that kind of information have some concerns. Inayat Singh has that story. Protesters across Canada are calling for police forces to address systemic racism within their ranks. I want change. Change is here. It is now. This is the time. What happens now affects what's next. Studies show black and other people of color in Canada are more likely to be stopped by the police. By collecting disaggregated race data, you can provide a baseline for a rational conversation. But so far, only Ontario requires police forces to collect race-based data, and only when an officer uses force. There have been a few race-based pilot projects. For example, Halifax police tracked who they were stopping for street checks. The data found that black people were disproportionately targeted and street checks were banned in Nova Scotia. It's not just about collecting race-based data in policing. It's really about what happens with that data. Who owns the data? How is the uh, community informed about this information? How is the information used to uh, inform policies, but also to inform practices. I know for a fact that we're victims. I can say it, and many people can say it too. Samuel's violent arrest in Laval, Quebec, went viral after he was pulled over by police. We agreed not to use his last name because he fears harassment. They're going to try to show, show us what they want to show us and not what we're supposed to, to see, you know? Systemic racism is what Ontario wants to identify and monitor. They will make their findings public next year, perhaps providing an example for other provinces to follow. Inayat Singh, CBC News, Toronto. Travel and tourism have been badly damaged by the coronavirus pandemic. One city that relies very heavily on foreign visitors has been especially hard hit. Back in November, devastating floods drove tourists out of Venice, then COVID-19 kept them away. Now many in the city say it's time to diversify the economy and make it stronger. And as Megan Williams explains, one of the solutions for the future of Venice may be in its past. Even with no passengers, gondolas still need care. 
Speriamo che torni un po' di artigianato locale. Di Lorenzo della Tofola e suo son Alberto are among the few still using centuries old building and repair techniques. Che ci sia qualche ripensamento, che ci sia. But he says he fears without government investment in Venice's rich and varied artisanal workshops, the old knowledge is destined to disappear. Laura Scarpa runs a network that promotes Venetian artisans and artists. She says for the fragile city to become resilient during crisis, it has to diversify its economy and invest in artisans who once were the pulse of Venice. If you save an artisan, you are saving the traditions and the culture. The Bottega Artigiana is a place where the community uh, stick around. And uh, a lot of... Uh, other people are involved uh, in the work of the artisan. Like this 200-year-old silk weaving workshop that sells its exquisite textiles to clients around the world, including the White House. It's important uh, because uh, thousands of people work uh, in uh, uh, this uh, activity, and uh, now we are the last. Uh, it's gone from a bustling three-story operation a century ago to just seven weavers now, mostly young and determined to pass the knowledge on. Like Valeria Boncompagno, who became a goldsmith after her family sold handmade jewelry for more than a century. She gives free workshops in schools and works in her shop so people can see the craft is still alive. The shop shows the piece handed but not the work behind, which is the most beautiful thing. So that's why I decided to put my bench here and uh, the work needs to be shown because it's the message. The message that Venice's artisanal traditions, which have given so much to the world, continue to give meaning and life to those who live here. Megan Williams, CBC News, Venice.
before we leave you tonight, we've got some developing political news in St. John's. At tonight's council meeting, Hope Jamison said she's stepping down from council. She's taken a new job with a national housing organization and says that would put her in a conflict of interest. Since it's more than a year until the next municipal election, that will likely mean a by-election for War 2. And that's it for Here and Now tonight. I'm Peter Cowan. Thanks so much for watching. I'll be back tomorrow night with another edition of the show. Take care.